Good morning, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be back in San Francisco uh, in one of these wonderful expos and meeting some uh, old friends and, and making new ones. Um, many of you will be familiar with the Ethiopian Wolves. I've been telling you about them all these years, although very few people will actually have seen them in the flesh because they are found only in a few mountain uh, enclaves in the highlands of Ethiopia. Uh, gorgeous looking creatures, uh, very special in the sense that they have specialized to live in, the, in these high plateaus. And that, in a way, has become uh, a, a, a reason for the demise. So they're now constrained to smaller and smaller mountain peaks, and there are only a few hundred of them left. Um, only uh, a week ago, even less, I was in Chafadalacha. As you could see in the, in the bottom picture there, I'm camping out at 13,000 feet with my team, and we're doing some, some work testing a canine distemper vaccine. Um, and it was uh, an opportunity to reminisce about the work we've been doing, about 30 years uh, of work with my team, a team that started as, as a team of two and now has more than 70 people, and thinking about how we have built the capacity, our capacity and that of our team, and how WCN has helped us to do so. Gorgeous creatures that thrive on these uh, uh, apparently barren but actually very rich uh, landscapes because of the incredible biomass of the small uh, grass rats and giant mole rats that provide uh, their main prey. Um, although solitary during the day, uh, because they're better off at catching the prey that way, uh, Ethiopian wolves will gather uh, together early in the morning, at noon, and evening to socialize. And those interactions, close interactions within the family pack, uh, glue and bond uh, these, uh, these social groups uh, in a way that helps them uh, benefit by uh, patrolling and protecting the home ranges together, and with larger packs being able to secure larger home ranges uh, with greater resources and therefore becoming more successful. Um, they also help the alpha mm -hmm. pair, the alpha female, bring up a litter of pups, hopefully once a year. There might be as many as seven of them. And this is the payoff I get for my work, because I get to see these guys very close up and personal, and see the dedication uh, they put in to provide for these pups. Not only they play with them, they guard the den to protect them from uh, other wolves or hyenas or any other threats, but also will bring food initially to the mother and, uh, and later on to supplement the diet of the little ones, which will hopefully grow into recruiting uh, into the pack and when those packs grow above a certain number, and we currently have a pack of 19 adults, um, and we're expecting six pups, perhaps, uh, in the next couple of weeks. So eventually that pack will split into two and will help recolonize some of the areas where the wolves are currently not found. Um, how do we know all this? Well, because we are fortunate enough to be able to see it with our own eyes. Many of my colleagues work on species that they don't get to see at all. Uh, whereas we just walk out of our camp, and sooner or later we will encounter them. Uh, here I am with my good friend Al Hussein, which is our senior wolf monitor, and he has uh, eagle eyes um, that will uh, spot wolves where you couldn't believe they're present. So through this basic uh, uh, field methodology, we are able to close, uh, uh, follow these animals close up and, and get into every detail of their intimate lives, and, and that helps us to plan uh, to protect them. Um, part of our work also reveals that the wolves are not alone there. They share the land with people, with the livestock, and with domestic dogs. And if you look up in the background of that picture, there is a wolf paying close attention to the dog that is having his picture taken here. <laughs> um, so these two are living hand in hand. And that brings in a situation where disease becomes a real issue. And I'm sure you have heard me talking about this before, that uh, rabies outbreaks and canine distemper outbreaks present the most uh, uh, um, acute and present danger to the wolves. Um, but we're able to tackle this, and we have some really good news uh, in recent times. Uh, through our One Health approach, we are able to protect the wolves, but in doing so, we also protect uh, the livestock and the dogs of the communities that live hand in hand with the wolves. Um, 
we've been for many years vaccinating domestic dogs, and we know that those communities where the dogs are vaccinated not only uh, have a, a healthier dog population, but also uh, there are fewer people that get attacked by dogs and might eventually develop rabies, which is a ghastly disease, but also fina financially better. The, uh, the livestock uh, survives better, and they are about $70 better off per household per year than those communities where the dogs are not vaccinated. Uh, people uh, will get a certificate, so we're able to track uh, how those, those dogs have been covered uh, and protected. And the interesting uh, outcome of these uh, vaccination campaigns is that now increasingly people will come to us and bring the dogs for vaccination, such as these young shepherds there. So uh, there, is a, there is an awareness of the importance of getting protection. Of course, there is a still a lot of work to do. And uh, uh, recently we have that had a great success in which we have, after many years of lobbying and, and uh, arguing with uh, government uh, uh, authorities, to test first and demonstrate the safety of an oral vaccine, which are we are now deploying. So we no longer have to respond uh, uh, to emergencies when animals get sick, but now we are able to preempt that by having the dogs vaccinated the way you will have your pets vaccinated. So this is a great success, and we just started a few months ago, and uh, uh, we should be able uh, every two or three years to vaccinate every population in Ethiopia. And it's a, a lot of fun because it allows us to be out there and spend time in the field. Um, how do we go about delivering these vaccines? A, a, in Europe, we eradicated rabies in, in France, parts of Germany and Switzerland by throwing oral vaccine baits out of helicopters. We do it in a more personalized way in Ethiopia by setting up uh, camera traps, and here is the team just testing one of those, and then uh, we just watch as the animals come, uh, find the baits and eat them up. Um, there's some interesting responses here because we have some youngsters that like these baits so much that will be back and back over again. So we have to <laughs> be careful that they don't uh, uh, over uh, end up uh, taking too many baits because there's a lot of work uh, involved in producing them. So once this happens, we have to move our, our baits away. But uh, it's looking great, and, and this really uh, offers an incredible tool for us to, to move forward. And having the wolves there also gives us the opportunity to protect these most wonderful uh, landscapes, which are unique to the highlands of Ethiopia. I like to refer to this as the roof of Africa. Um, and there are many other species that also benefit from this protection, in addition to natural resources, such as, such as, uh, as the water catchment, but the chelada baboons, um, uh, uh, Rushat's rail, uh, uh, subspecies of uh, black and white colorless monkeys, uh, uh, starkey hares, mountain yalas. These are species you will find nowhere else but in the highlands of Ethiopia. And chief among them, <laughs> my good old friend, and I'm sure you have met him before, the giant mole rat, found only in the Bali Mountains. So they're extremely rare <laughs> and extremely paranoid <laughs> to the point <laughs> that they, the eyes have migrated to the top of his skull <laughs> so that uh, they don't need to uh, stick their head out too far out of the burrows <laughs> to avoid being eaten. But it remains the most important and favorite prey for the wolves. Conservation doesn't take place in isolation. So we have to work with people that rely on those resources. And one of, the most uh, of our most successful programs is our biodiversity friendly futures. We work with people to try to help them use those resources in a more sustainable way. Here, for instance, a family uh, living in the highlands that will rely on erica, this ericaceous vegetation for, uh, for, the, for firewood, for lighting, for building. And of course, if they were to use at these, and there is a little bit of a tragedy of the commons there because land is not owned uh, uh, but shared, uh, we end up having an overuse of resources and serious degradation issues. Um, the communities uh, discuss, the, discuss their, uh, um, the, the use of, the, of, of those resources together, and we help them become a little bit more more sustainable, for instance, fuel-saving stoves with women that prepare those stoves and sell them to, to the community. It's a nice story uh, here at Sahai, a woman that with other four friends started 
uh, making those, uh, those stoves with the funds that we provide. And she's been able to, to save some money and become uh, really independent and able to, to expand her line of business. Um, Honey production also, with producers protecting Erica Morelands, uh, uh, where the bees feed. And this is very particularly interesting, the use of this festuca grass uh, that is important for, for building uh, materials, which uh, through the growing of Wasa Gardens, we are able to restore uh, uh, the, the habitat and also provide a cash crop. Um, uh, we also work patrolling fires and so on. But just trying to get to how we go about enabling a team to acquire the skills so we can do our work better. Um, on this picture, uh, back to 1987, my early graduate years, the chap on the ski jacket next to me, uh, Idris Ebu, age 16. He was starting uh, uh, his work with me. And on the right, a very established program manager uh, that without whom we couldn't exist. So this is organic training, you know, training on the workplace, but uh, incredibly efficient. Um, Training of, uh, uh, of community guards, for instance, in Borena Saint National Park, this uh, comes from the local community, and we give them the tools and the equipment so that they can protect the, those resources that are so important. So different types of training, but essential for the work we do. And the more formal way, and Joyce mentioned this, is a partnership with a wild team with uh, financial support from WCN that help us get a grasp of project management. And this might sound very tedious, as tedious of your accounting needs, but for us, it has been an eye-opener. For instance, that you can only have one line manager. You know, simple, basic facts that, you know, you have to know, have a clear line of command and uh, responsibilities and so on. Using uh, trackers, which are very simple Excel files which we can, uh, with multiple access that allows people to keep tabs on where they are with the work programs and so on. Uh, there is an element of training, but there is also uh, tests. So we now have a qualified... Uh, a group of team leaders that are able to track the progress and the progress of their colleagues and, uh, and uh, follow their objectives and make sure that we meet those goals. So this has revolutionized the way uh, we do our work. But equally important has been the support we had from WCN uh, for formal training of our people um, and semi-formal training. For instance, just as an example, we have Alo Hussein on the top left Mustafa Dule, they benefited from uh, uh, partnership, uh, 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 in, uh, partner internships that WCN offers that allows people to go and visit other uh, WCN projects. Uh, uh, Musti went to CCF in Namibia, got some training there. Alo has visited his colleagues in Kenya. Some of his uh, Kenyan colleagues from, uh, uh, from Iwaso Lions have been over to Ethiopia uh, to learn from our people. So this is an amazing way of uh, sharing knowledge. Uh, many meetings and training in the field, and on the right, on the more academic side, uh, Gebeyo Rizka, is Gebeyo here? Well, he's, I don't see him, but Gebeyo did his diploma at Oxford University with us, has done his master's in, the UK, uh, in, in Ethiopia, thanks to scholarships from WCN. And at the top, the Dr. Girma Shete, he recently got his PhD from Leiden University in the Netherlands with a scholarship from WCN. So we're now able to put truly qualified people to do the work that I no longer could do or should be doing, but uh, I I'm, I'm feel properly backed up by having these wonderful people behind us. So thank you very much for your support. We couldn't do without you.